Welcome. I think this is my 21st weekly eco rant since the lockdown began. And I say again, maybe, just maybe, I'm finally beginning to see an end to it. Still, for the moment, rant on. I'm Andrew Hilton, and my day job is to run a little city think tank. Well, that's fine. Uh, but just sometimes I worry about more than Basel III or IFRS 9 or even whether the Financial Stability Board is up to the job this week. For instance, I think it's hard not to worry about two things which are very closely linked. The first is US-China relations, which seem to get worse day by day. And the second is the US election. Uh, which is now just three months away and also gets more difficult day by day. <clears throat> They're linked. The two of them, I think, are linked primarily because President Trump has consciously, but in my opinion, dangerously, decided to make China the centerpiece of his re-election campaign. That's not entirely a surprise. China has for years and certainly since it joined the World Trade Organization, been exploiting the global trading system, stealing intellectual property, imposing technology transfer provisions of dubious legality on companies that wanted to enter its market, and generally ignoring WTO rules whenever it felt uh, that it wanted to do so. All the while, making fools of those naive Westerners who firmly believed that letting China into the global trading system on extraordinarily advantageous terms would lead Beijing to dump its ideology in favor of liberal democracy. Well, Trump wasn't wrong to grasp this particular nettle, and not just because China has been running a bilateral trade surplus with the United States of $400 billion or more a year, and now has over $3 trillion of foreign exchange reserves. But what is scary is that Trump now really seems to be trying to engineer a strategic confrontation with China. In the last week, for instance, he signed an executive order banning any transaction with TikTok or with its pair of bike dots or with WeChat owned by Tencent on the part of, and I quote, any person or, any person or involving any property subject to the jurisdiction of the United States, which is an exceptionally broad wording with extraterritorial implications. This comes into effect in 45 days, which uh, Trump has now made clear ought to be enough time for a US company, Microsoft probably, or less plausibly Twitter, to buy TikTok, uh, though not, I would add, WeChat, in which case the, to rub salt into the wounds, Trump is also suggesting that the happy bidder should pay a finder's fee to the US Treasury. It could have been worse. He could have demanded that the finest fee be paid to his own presidential campaign. But the point is, it doesn't sound serious. It just sounds as though Trump is deliberately picking a fight. He is. He also sent his Secretary of Health, Alex Azar, to Taiwan over the weekend, the highest ranking US official to visit Taipei since 1979. It's a deliberate attempt to goad Beijing. Why? Well, he clearly wants to paint the democratic leadership as soft on China, which is important because it would open up a split between the Democratic Party itself and its core supporters in the labor unions who are at least as hawkish on China as Trump is. Plus, Trump is trying to shore up his base with Christian fundamentalists who still think in terms of godless communism. Hence, earlier in the week, Secretary of State Pompeo, who, as we know, is a committed evangelical who actually believes in the imminent rapture, laid out a series of uh, demands that China must meet before being let, into, let back into Washington's good graces. This quote, clean path is primarily tech related, but the key demand, which is clearly unacceptable to Beijing, is that Chinese tech firms must demonstrate unequivocally that they will not ever act as agents of the Chinese government. 
as one UK tech guru pointed out to me, that's not a claim that Cisco, for instance, would ever have made with regard to its own relationship with the US government in Washington. Now, Trump has doubled down. He's uh, hitting around a dozen Chinese and Hong Kong officials, including the hapless Carrie Lam, with personal sanctions. That's a big deal if you like to do your shopping at Saks or if you want to send your little princelings to Harvard or Yale. So how will Beijing respond? Well, I know that the China Daily last week will invade against what it called, and I quote again, a cabal of wackadoodles in Washington, bring, who are driven, in the China Daily's opinion, by, and I quote, crude capitalist Christian ideology. Bringing religion into it may be what Trump wants, but boy, is that dangerous. Now, Beijing has also just engineered the arrest of a major Hong Kong media tycoon, Jimmy Lai, which a well-connected friend of mine calls a very big deal indeed, bigger than we realize in the West, not least because it comes after a long campaign of systematic denigration of Xi Jinping's former friend and hero, Li Kaxing. Something is up. So what next? Australia's Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, writing in the current issue of Foreign Affairs, calls this the most dangerous moment in US-China affairs since the Taiwan Straits crisis of the 1950s. And I cannot help thinking that we may hear more about Quimoi, which is now called Kinmen, and the Matsu Islands before this year is out. Will this work to boost Trump's electoral standing? Well, hard to say. But with the economist of the, with the exception of the latest economist YouGov poll, which still has Biden ahead of Trump by nine points, Trump has been picking up support. According to the most recent polls in The Hill and by Rasmussen, two respected pollsters, Biden is now only ahead by three percentage points, which is not hopeless. Moreover, Wall Street seems finally to have got the message that a Biden presidency could well be the most left-wing presidency since Carter or indeed even since FDR. Hence, a ton of money has suddenly come Trump's way. What's got Wall Street so exercised? Well, I suppose the most important thing is that America's political center of gravity has shifted sharply to the left, and Biden, whose whole career had been as an old-school centrist schmoozer without an ideological bone in his body, has shifted with it, taking his cue from Bernie Sanders and Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, on their Green New Deal and potentially their view also on wealth taxes. Plus, there's his commitment to broaden the Fed's mandate for, from fighting inflation and promoting employment to include racial diversity. Wall Street bankers might sign up to various pieties about anti-racism, but when it comes to their own wallets, they remain quite skeptical. They would rather take a knee to mammon than to Black Lives Matter. There's also Biden's choice of vice president, which is important, much more important this time than usual, because if he wins, he will be 78 when he's inaugurated, which is older than Reagan was when he stepped down. Significantly, this decision keeps getting delayed. It's now scheduled, not for this week, but for next week. The general feeling is that he was about to announce Senator Kamala Harris as his VP a couple of weeks ago, but then got cold feet when he realized that although Harris is half Jamaican and half Indian, she's not well loved by black opinion leaders, thanks to her time as a district attorney and as attorney general in California, where she was thought to be, perish the thought, pro-police. For what it's worth, she's also not your usual daughter of sharecroppers, rags to Washington, that kind of thing. Jamaican immigrants in the US are among the most successful and wealthy groups in the country. 
Remember Colin Powell and Indians? Well, look around you, look at Silicon Valley, it's full of Indians, wealthy Indians. If Biden doesn't go with Harris, who is also said not to be a team player, the second choice is probably Obama's former national security advisor, Susan Rice. But she's never been elected to anything and she knows very little about domestic politics. It's a conundrum. Personally, I still would like to see Governor Gretchen Whitmer, a moderate who is unfortunately lily white. Still, we'll see. I know that Whitmer actually got to visit Biden in his basement last week, which has got some people talking her up. Anyone but Whitmer would, in my opinion, enable Trump to double down on his second line of attack after China, which is that Biden has caved in to the Black Lives, Movement, Black Lives Matter movement and to Antifa, and that uh, law and order would break down under a Biden administration. Given what's still happening in Portland and in other cities, particularly those controlled by the Democrats, I have some sympathy with this. His third line of attack is uh, simply Biden's age and his increasingly obvious infirmity. Biden's staff is apparently looking for a way anyway uh, to avoid having him debate Trump on national television, ostensibly because Trump lies, but in fact, because they're all terrified of what ghastly mistake Biden might make if they do try to wriggle out of it. They're currently committed to three debates. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how the media, particularly the New York Times and the Washington Post, handle it. Still, on balance, Biden is still the hot favourite, just not quite as hot as he was a couple of weeks ago. Whether Trump continues to narrow the gap probably depends almost as much on the COVID-ravaged US economy as it does on China or indeed on Biden himself. And here, the runes don't look too good. Anyone who's listened to what I've had to say before knows first that I'm firmly convinced that the global economic damage wrought by the coronavirus and by the draconian government responses to the virus is lasting and severe, and that hopes of a V-shaped recovery, uh, beloved of our own chief economist Andy Haldane and Washington's Larry Kudlow, are pretty much a fantasy, and second, that it would be sheer, utter, complete madness to lock down the global economy again, even though there is virtually no chance at all of eliminating the coronavirus until and unless there's a cheap, effective, and universally available vaccine. We'll have to live with it, and we better get used to it. So let's learn, let's look at what we've learned in the last week or so. The most significant economic release of the last week was probably the final uh, purchasing managers indices for July, which were generally an improvement from June for both manufacturing and services, and which were generally above 50, which is the, uh, air, the, the cutoff line for growth. There were, however, a few outliers. In particular, Markets manufacturing PMI for the US actually fell back from 51.3 to 50.9, in other words, just barely growth. Japan's PMIs for both manufacturing and services remained below 50, though there were a slight improvement from June. And China's services PMI, that's the non manufacturing PMI, fell from 58.4 to 54.1 still growing at a fair old lick, but not quite at such a frenetic pace. Here in the UK, the manufacturing PMI eased in July from 53.6 to 53.3, while the services PMI notched down from 56.6 to 56.5. Tiny, but we were the only major country where both manufacturing and services slowed last month. Though, to be fair, they're both still growing. Should we be worried about this apparent slowdown? Yes, not least because real-time data, that is card payments and things like that, which much of which is proprietary, also indicates some sort of slowdown. In addition, it makes sense, and not just in the UK, 
we're coming to a point where at least some of the government stimulus programs are starting to be wound down. And that means that almost everywhere we are going to see a sharp rise in unemployment. In that kind of an environment, discretionary spending will inevitably fall and precautionary savings will equally inevitably increase. And that will mean lower growth. However, these two factors haven't really started to kick in yet, at least not in the lagging data. In the US, for instance, we're still focusing on the recovery as people catch up um, with the spending that they were unable to do during lockdown. Last week, for instance, it was reported that non-farm payrolls in the US increased 1.76 million in July, admittedly down from 4.8 million in June, but a bit better than expected. That pushed the US unemployment rate down from 11.1% to 10.2%, but that's still three times the rate in February, since when the US has lost 13 million jobs. Wow. It's also reported last week that total vehicle sales in the US were up 9.7% in July and that factory orders were up 6.2%, but that was down from a rise of 7.7% in June. Again, it's catching up at least a bit. In other words, okay, for now, the UK US economy is recovering, but the pace of recovery is slowing, and there is every reason to believe it will continue to slow. What of Europe? Well, at the Eurozone level, the pattern is pretty much the same. Retail sales for June were up 5.7% month on month, but that was down from a gain of 20.3% in May as the region first started to come out of lockdown. That was also true amongst several of the member states. In Italy, for instance, industrial production was up 8.2% in June after a rise of 42% in May. However, it's worth noting that there was a record jump of 28% in German factory orders in June, with export orders picking up sharply. That's genuinely encouraging, but only if you're German. Here in the UK, the main focus last week was the Bank of England's latest economic projections, which, perhaps not surprisingly, given that Andy Haldane is the chief economist, were widely felt to be a tad on the over-optimistic side. The bank apparently expects the unemployment rate in the UK to peak at 7.5% at the end of this year, with GDP down 9.5% for the year. That sounds terrible, and it is, but it's better than the bank's May forecast, which uh, was for a fall of 14%. Even so, the bank does accept that there'll be a slowdown, an economic slowdown, a sharp economic slowdown in the third quarter, and it also accepts that its forecasts are unusually uncertain. What is pretty certain, at least to me, is that we really ought to rethink our lockdown policy. Last week, I brought up the example of Sweden again and suggested that this week's second quarter GDP data would reveal whether Sweden's economy suffered as a result of its much more relaxed approach to lockdown. The answer is that it didn't. True, Swedish GDP was down 8.6% quarter on quarter, uh, in the April-June quarter, but that was substantially better than the 12% drop for the Eurozone as a whole. And indeed, the only EU countries that did better that were Latvia and Lithuania. I hope that some of our policymakers took note of that, though I also note a tortured piece in today's Financial Times arguing, in my opinion, against the evidence that Sweden's more relaxed policy didn't work and that it has now been repudiated. It did, and it hasn't been. At least not in my opinion. But what's next? In the US, there's agreement that more stimulus is needed, but no agreement on how much or how it ought to be directed. Indeed, Democrats and Republicans in Congress were so split last week that they were completely unable to agree on a compliant, uh, 
a complete package before the Senate recessed on Friday evening, with the Democrats pushing a $3 trillion package that has prompted apoplexy among more conservative economists for the pork that it promised to Democrat, Democratic run states and local governments. And the Republicans wedded to a one billion mini bill that included new fighter jets and a new FBI building, neither of which is needed. The result, which does neither side any credit at all, was stalemate. And not surprisingly, Trump jumped in. Over the weekend, he announced a number of uh, new measures by executive order. These which, to be fair, he had flagged in advance included first, a moratorium on household and business evictions. Uh, second, a new supplemental unemployment benefit scheme that would amount to about $400 a week down from the current super generous $600 a week with companies picking up around a quarter of the tab. Third, a deferral of payroll tax liability for small and medium sized it work, it workers in small and medium sized companies. And fourth, some sort of relief on student loans. Now, anti Trumpers or never Trumpers, for instance, the New York Times are up in arms, even though ideologically they probably agree with most of these measures. They insist that the executive orders are unconstitutional, which may be true, and that the courts will have to overturn them, which also may be true. In the meantime, however, Trump has done what Congress couldn't or wouldn't do, and he really ought to get some credit for that. As for Europe, well, the EU27 is still pushing its $750 billion recovery and resilience fund through national parliaments, and it's not finding the going too easy. On the one hand, the Northern Europeans are still unhappy at the way the frugal four capitulated. Finland's ex-foreign minister, Timo Swiney, for instance, wrote a letter to the FT last week complaining that the whole thing was cooked up by the France and Germany for their own domestic political reasons for France to advance its agenda of European integration dominated by French bureaucracy and for Germany to provide, I like this one, for Germany to provide vendor financing for its exports. I'm sure there's some truth in both of those. On the other hand, the French have now put the cat among the pigeons by resuscitating the idea, which most people have felt have been put to rest, that EU largesse should be conditional on recipient governments uh, committing to tow the Brussels, Paris, Berlin party line on rule of law issues, which really means an attack on centre-right Catholic nationalist parliaments, uh, governments in Poland, Hungary, Czechia, Slovakia, and so on. I think it's unfair. Others of a more liberal position feel it's quite understandable. Here in the UK, the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee surprised no one last week by leaving interest rates and its asset purchase program unchanged, and it met. But there is new awareness that there's going to be hell to pay when the furlough scheme ends in October. And even Rishi Sunak, speaking over the weekend, appeared to accept that it will have to be ex extended in some form or another. The question is, in what form and who's going to pick up the tab? So far, the scheme has supported around nine and a half million workers, but it's also cost £31 billion. Pounds, and there's plenty of evidence that it is starting to act as a disincentive to many workers who are loath to go back to work in the office or in the factory. Plus, I sense that in the UK, what is also hap happening is what's happening in the US, that there's a growing reluctance amongst businesses uh, to avail themselves to the fullest extent of all the government aid that is out there, not least because of the 13th month problem, how they're going to cope when loans have to be serviced, when grace periods end, and when repayments have to start to be made. None of this is very encouraging, and it started to impact on the markets. Not yet, I should add. On equities, at least not so much, but the dollar has been bouncing around 
week before last, for instance, it was down across the board, off 1.7% against the euro, off 2.6% against sterling, and even down a tad against the yen. This was being put down to at least four things. First, Trump's alleged mishandling of the coronavirus problem. Second, a fear that inflationary pressures might be building up in the US, though I don't see them yet. Third, some concern about the impact of a Biden victory, particularly on the Fed and on the US economy more generally. And fourth, a sort of belief that the dollar is kind of overvalued anyway on a purchasing power parity basis, perhaps by five or 10 percent. So no surprise that there was a bit of a sell off. Really, the surprise was that uh, the dollar had been so strong for so long. However, that weakness two weeks ago didn't last. Last week, the dollar bounced back, closing on Friday, up around 0.5% against the euro, 0.7% against sterling, and even a little bit against the yen. It seems to have regained its safe, self, so its safe haven status as the best currency to be in in a storm. And boy, do we have a storm. Though the big winner last week was gold, which closed on Friday at around 2067 bucks an ounce, only a tad lower than the 2070 that it reached on Thursday. That's up over 35% for the year to date. And it's got gold nuts all over the world salivating at the prospect of $3,000 or more as the gold price. A couple of words of caution, however. First, one reason that the gold price has spiked appears to be a lot of gold buying by wealthy Hong Kong residents who are trying to get money out of the territory. Expect the authorities in Beijing, if not in Hong Kong, to clamp down on that one way or another. Second, much of the pressure for higher gold prices is coming from gold ETFs, exchange traded funds, which have seen inflows of around $40 billion in the first half of 2020. The problem is that one of the biggest of those ETFs, uh, one which now controls more physical gold than either India or Japan, is a partnership between State Street and the World Gold Council. And the World Gold Council has as its core purpose to drive the gold price higher. That's what they do. Not exactly, I think, a disinterested party. Nevertheless, gold has smashed just about every chart point that was out there. We shall see. What else? Well, I haven't said anything about Lebanon, though obviously a few things do need to be said. First, uh, one should say that for years it has been a dysfunctional state verging on failed state status, kept afloat only by, ex how can I put it, extremely creative central bank accounting sleight of hand. Second, that Lebanon has been systematically looted by every religious group or tribal clan that has managed to get its hands in the cookie jar over the last 40 years. Third, that it probably has the wealthiest and cleverest diaspora in the world, but don't expect them to put their hands in their pockets for a country that, uh, in their eyes at least, barely exists. I might note that the new editor of the Financial Times is Lebanese, and that does suggest that there is room for at least thinking about creative solutions to the Lebanese problem. Anyway, uh, given what I think is particularly interesting is that the rapturous welcome that uh, President Macron got when he visited uh, Beirut ahead, I should add, of, of any of the local politicians must have given him a rush especially those calls for France to resume the, the mandate that it operated under to administer Lebanon from 1920 to 1946. It would be an irony if in a world of, you know, a year of ahistorical wokeism and a wholesale rejection of history, a population, particularly one as sophisticated as the Lebanese, willingly submitted itself to new colonial rule. Of course, it won't happen. More's the pity for Lebanon, but it would have been a good joke, even if I imagine Hezbollah would not see the funny side. And then, well, there's Spain. Don Juan has nothing on King, former King Juan Carlos. 5,000 lovers? 
and $100 million in the bank worth being king for. Enough this week. Watch for second quarter GDP growth here in the UK, which according to the Bank of England could be down 20% or more. Also watch for second quarter growth in the Eurozone more generally for the August ZEW, ZEW survey in Germany. And in the US, interestingly, the flash estimate for the Michigan confidence indicator for August will be pretty important. Thanks for watching.